Our God and our Father, we thank you for today, for the wonderful gift of life, and for bringing us all here safely this evening. Lord, we thank you for the life lived by VCRAC Crab, one of hard work, integrity, and humility. For his God-fearing nature, we thank you. We also thank you for the opportunity to celebrate his life and pray that through this memorial lecture, we're able to emulate those virtues to the glory of your name and in respect of his memory. All this we ask through Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you're once again welcome to the very first VCRAC Crab Memorial Lecture. Now, for those who you know who would have loved to be here but are unable to, we're streaming live on Facebook, so you can just ask them to visit Mpuntunsen page and chime in to this wonderful conversation. Now, as we start this memorial lecture and this evening's program, let me quote a wise man who said, you go through life, you meet certain experiences. They are meant to teach you. No circumstance is a misfortune. Our misfortunes are fortunes in disguise. Ladies and gentlemen, that is from VCRAC Crab. And in case you haven't been able to read and know more about him, I would advise that you get a copy of this wonderful biography. On that note, how about we invite the author to come and give us welcoming remarks. Kesu Yamwak, he's the author and the executive director of Mpuntun Sem Foundation. You're welcome. A round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. So, and thank you all for coming. This is a family moment, and um, great things are bound to happen today. They, they were clear, it was some sort of an experiment not to send out the usual invitations, you know, send out invitation cards and the others, but the idea was to find out those of us who really, um, cherished the man for he, who he was. So everybody here, really, it's here because of love. A love for Justice Crab, a love for what he stood for, and for what we are coming to talk about today. So thank you for coming. Impunta Sem Foundation is, is uh, quite a young organization, but it's also done a lot of work, a lot of work, not only in Ghana, but we've worked a lot around the continent We've done some work for the African Union in Addis Ababa. We've been to Botswana, done some work there. Um, what we do, we are into development and communication. We have a bigger vision to re-engineer the narratives we have about ourselves, because ultimately that's what it is about. What we tell ourselves and what we, we say is about the narratives and how we control our narratives and tell them. And it was something that Justice Crabb inspired. Uh, writing this book uh, took three years before we finally published it. Um, of course, the writing itself was six months. Normally, my writing is six months. Whatever it is, it's a project of six months. But uh, Justice Crabb being a master of words, uh, my first draft, he was very happy with it. And I said, hallelujah. I mean, if a master of words is pleased with the first draft of his life story. Uh, I, had, I had really done a lot then. So back and forth, back and forth. So by the time we launched it, it had taken three years of relationship. And beyond that, um, it continued for another almost four years or so before he passed. So this is somebody I more or less, almost on a daily basis, um, what could sometimes you be there, crazy, can, so it was that, you know, the behind the scene assignments and all of that. And, we felt that the, first, the best thing to do would be to have this lecture in his honor. And we'd like to thank the family, and we'd like to thank the friends, and everybody for coming. So we would like to, I would like to humbly to ask all of us to be on our feet, to have a moment of silence. 
And when we are done, you realize that where you are, this is basically the, pro the program. The outline is on one side, and then and there's a quote, a very powerful quote from this book. And then there's a sheet of paper, which is a song that we will sing after the uh, minutes of silence. Uh, now, uh, praise we great and famous men. So shall we be on our feet if we can? Um, I know the... Okay. Silence. May the beautiful and gentle soul of our brother, our mentor, our father, and our justice, VCRC Krab, rest in peace. And may the souls of all the faithful departed rest in the bosom of the Almighty God. Amen. So shall we now sing, we'll sing the now praise we most famous men and then we'll do the few introductions then we'll start with the lecture everybody is here Amen. 
very much. Mr. Amok, thank you very, very much. Another quote that I would like to bring to you from VCRAC Crab. I believe gradually a new generation of selfless and dedicated individuals will raise this country up to its true destination. The realization will come, and when the realization comes, we will change. Now, as Mr. Amok did mention, this is a family. We are the family of VCRAC Crab. If we didn't know him, we've read about him. If you haven't read about him, we are in this peaceful nation partly because of his works. And so in every way, we are family. And as family, we should know each other. Definitely, there are persons that I will introduce. But before I do that, the gentleman or the lady to your left or to your right, in front or behind, how about you get to know your family better with a handshake, a good evening, a how are you doing? So I believe that since we the Crabites have gotten to know each other, <laughs> there is one gentleman in particular who, when you read about VCRAC Crab, I'm sure you'd want to know him, to meet him, to see him, and he is here with us this evening. I'd like to start by introducing our special guest. Mr. Kwekuba. I think he deserves more than a round of applause. I think a standing ovation would not be bad at all. Sir, it is an honor and a privilege to meet you, to finally see you. And I must say, I've read a lot about you. <laughs> it's very good to meet you, sir. You're very, very welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the theme for this, you may all have a seat. Thank you. The theme for this occasion, cultivating integrity as a cornerstone for nation building, apt for the kind of man who has brought us here today, the man filled with integrity. Now we're going to receive an insightful lecture, and that lecture is going to be given to us by Professor Thaddeus Ulzen. And I will introduce him, and I'm sure he'll introduce himself, because I must tell you, if I'm to start with the introductions and to list, we'll be here until tomorrow morning. So he will bring his, his introduction to you. We have distinguished ladies and gentlemen among us. We will introduce them as the program goes on. But how about we start with why we're here, with this memorial lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please do help me introduce, with a resounding round of applause, Professor Thaddeus Ulzen. He will be presenting the lecture on the topic, Cultivating Integrity as a Cornerstone for Nation Building. Sir, you're warmly welcome. I think we can clap until he gets to the podium. <laughs> you. Good evening. Uh, we need you to be a bit more awake. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here um, and an honor to be with you today to speak on the topic of integrity under the auspices of the Imputin Seven Foundation within the context of the life journey of one of the greatest jurists of our lifetime. When I agreed to give this lecture, as with most things that I consider to be a public service, I really didn't give it much thought. I simply agreed. I said, where and when? And so I'm here. It sounded like a good thing to do, and that's why I'm here. I have over the years uh, written a few essays on the place of ethics 
in leadership and development within our own historical and developmental context. And also our future possibilities as a nation. That may be partly why I'm here, but I never actually asked the organizers why they chose me for this task. I still don't know. I would like to welcome all of you, distinguished guests, our special guest, Honorable Kweku Ba, members of the Mpuntisem Foundation Board, members of the media, members of Justice Crabbe's family, colleagues, friends, the other panelists, members of the learning public like myself, to what I hope will be an evening that will spur an exchange of ideas that will serve us well in whatever we do for this beloved country of ours. It's always good to share your sources in a situation like this. I did read the authorized biography of Justice Crabb written by Kwesi Amwak, but I was surprised that he subtitled it An Unfinished Journey because it was about a man who had lived what seemed to be by most standards, a very full and long life. <laughs> so I, I, I wondered about that. I knew nothing about legal drafting um, when I started reading the book, and also didn't know anything about what a parliamentary council did. So that was a big learning curve uh, for me. But what struck me was that on the night of March 5th, 1957, when this country was on the verge of independence, this gentleman and a small team of legal drafters were putting together 40 acts and 40 ordinances to make, to create the legal background for the foundation of this country. So this is the first thing I, I learned um, about him. And it places him, of course, in a unique position in the history of our country because all future constitutions draw from his original work um, on, on the eve of uh, independence and form the foundation of our legal lives in the modern era. So our first stop on the Integrity Express would have to do with the constitution of the country. What is the integrity of the document itself? Is it a living and breathing document that still serves the citizens of the country? Many will say that a constitution that indemnifies any group of people, such as ours does, creates two sets of citizens right away from the outset, when all are supposed to be equal before the law. So that was one of the thoughts I had. But early in the Nkrumah administration, Justice Crabb also advised the government of the day, which was struggling with a legal process to address what today we would call homegrown terrorism from the secessionist National Liberation Movement with the Preventative Detention Act. He proposed a number of checks and balances for this act. Uh, that would make it achieve its goal without trampling on the rights of citizens. However, as politicians tend to do, his warnings were ignored and the law was enacted without the proposed safety checks and we all know what happened thereafter. Following this, without going into too much detail, Justice Crabb established our Electoral Commission as we know it today for the return of the country to civilian governance after the NLC era. He also introduced the ideas, the idea and laws governing the Council of State in an attempt to integrate our traditional and modern forms of governance at the highest level. Soon after our independence in 1963, he found himself, quote, thrown into the void by our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, to do for Uganda what he had done for Ghana. His presence in Uganda as parliamentary council was critical in maintaining the stability of that country for as long as it lasted in that complex geopolitical situation. 
I never had the privilege of meeting Justice Crabb, but his biography resonated with me. I come from a public service family where serving the country passionately was and still is the most cherished value of my family. I was educated about the educational entrepreneurs who founded Accra Academy, and I was also reminded of my own family's arrival at the Entebbe airport on 27th of August, 1967, after the coup. I didn't know where Entebbe was until the day we were about to leave. And this, of course, gave birth to a long unintended exile for three generations of my own family. Speaking of East Africa, that is where I saw the first evidence of anything that looked like what African unity was supposed to look like. Because of the East African community, we flew on East African airways, there was an East African railway system, and all of these institutions had this gentleman, Justice Crabb, behind them. He was very, very involved in, in, in the work of the East African community. He had a similar role in establishing the legal framework of countries like Kenya, Zimbabwe, and later in his career at the University of West Indies, he taught legal drafting to the global legal community as an academic. Justice Crabb's professional life is a compendium of institutions whose integrity safeguard the processes of a nation. Our topic today, cultivating integrity as a cornerstone for nation building, is one that is not far from our national consciousness. We think about it every day. As a matter of fact, before this talk, we were talking about it informally, uh, before I got up here. We, but I don't know what we do to sustain it as a core value within our nation. Let's start with the end of life, which is a sure destination for all of us. At that time, nobody ever talks about how many houses the person built and, you know, all of this stuff. On that day, most contributions and remembrances are about dimensions of character and ethics. Most people are referred to with words like good, wise, courageous, loving, hard worker, a truth teller, honesty, loyalty, etc. These are the words that are used to remember the dead. And as these things go, after I had written all of this, then uh, Honorable Elijah E. Cummings died in the United States, who was the chairman of the Oversight Committee of Congress. And in eulogizing him, Barack Obama said, Elijah Cummings was honorable before he became the honorable Elijah Cummings. <laughs> and that, that is what we should look for in people that we expect to lead us. So, many institutions have the word integrity or dimensions of integrity in their motives. My alma mater, University of Ghana, is Integri Procedamus, Integrity and Progress. St. Augustine's Omnia Vincent Labor speaks to the value of work, a dimension of integrity, as does the motto of GSTS, where Professor Akosa and I met. <laughs> Mente et manu, with your hands and with your mind. Wesley girls, live pure, speak true, right, wrong, follow the king. The follow the king part may have to be revised. Holy child, facta non verba, deeds, not words. Infantiman, obranyawara bo. Opokuari, Deus looks scientia, knowledge is light. So around us, as young people, clues about integrity are drummed into our heads on a daily basis. I have not attempted to define the subject of this discussion, but simply drawn attention to various aspects of the elephant we call integrity. To define the word would limit the scope 
of its essence and its pervasiveness within most cultures. It is sometimes an individual trait, as we've noted. Often it's an institutional trait, as it is captured in many mission statements, and hopefully it is also part of a national ethos. Ours is freedom and justice, and I believe it speaks to liberty and the search towards a just society. So, is integrity a core national value? This was the question I had for myself as I was uh, preparing for this. It is a critical question. If it is, where are the seeds of integrity planted? When are they planted? And by whom are they planted? And how is it cultivated? It may start within the culture of families, as Justice Crabb affirms in an interview about the state of our nation. Because as he says, a nation is made up of families. A nation is also made up of various institutions and of many old values and traditions. Transparency is a key ingredient of this elusive characteristic we call integrity. So, it is also we we, when it is found, integrity is, is the bedrock of excellence, which is the essence of Addis Adel College's motto, vel primus, vel cum primus, always the best, the best always with the best. Central to excellence is planning and future-oriented thinking, as in Fancy Pim School reminds us of Dren Hrakan. Key to institutional integrity is defining the mission and fidelity to the mission and its core fundamental values. When facts are laid bare, the truth always triumphs. As they say, democracy dies in darkness. So when it takes a lifetime to pass a right to information bill, it says something about the institution of parliament in this country. However, Another institution reminds us about the fundamental pathway of integrity in public life. UDS says, knowledge for service. We live to serve the nation, and wherever you live or wherever you are, little sparks of service seemingly occurring outside the glare of the bright stage lights together move a nation in the right direction. We have slowly but surely come become an anti-intellectual society. But without knowledge, we cannot be of service to our country and citizens of this great land. Our citizens seem to have little interest in factual information these days. Many of our operational systems shun any kind of evaluative processes. VCRSC Crab would not recognize the decision-making systems of this country today. He warned often of the politicization of many aspects of national life which demanded a broad-based consensus in the search for answers. Illiteracy is a dangerous element of underdevelopment. But even more dangerous is pseudo-illiteracy. By this, I mean those who do not know that they know not. The pathway to rapid development for a country like ours lies in appropriate and well thought out investments in two key areas, health and education of its citizens. We see that the integrity of our healthcare system, for example, is challenged daily on the airwaves by sellers of products that seem to cure every condition known to man. Yet we are at funerals every weekend and we don't seem to make any connection between these two things. <laughs> We cannot have a functioning healthcare system without a very robust health literacy program as part of citizenship development. At the core, our health problems undermine the productive capacities of our citizens in key areas like agriculture, industry, the democratic process itself, and in local development. Against this background, it feels unreal that most of the first 100 days of any newly elected government in this country 
is spent in an, by the destruction of having to retrieve state properties in the form of vehicles and other materials from their predecessors. The theft of state property is really a criminal act and the paralytic response of our judicial and law enforcement agencies is also uninspiring to say the least. The failure to act may be read to mean that members of one administration hope to avail themselves of the same items on their exit day at some point in the future. The most important decisions of a government are not political ones, they are ethical ones. Here, successive governments of both major parties have shown a disturbing lack of political will to act in a manner that reinforces the rule of law in society. Without a clear moral and ethical framework within which the public is led, every act of an administration is undermined by the powerful symbolism of weakness and a failure to act when the need was pressing. To many, these are piddling little issues, but they cast a long and dirty shadow over every act of our political leaders. The inertia around issues of crime and punishment only serve to undermine the faith the electorate have in the ethical basis of the constitution of the state. I will quote the 15th Prime Minister of Canada, Pierre Trudeau, who said, I want to separate sin from crime. You may have to ask forgiveness for your sins from God, but not from the Minister of Justice. <laughs> Since when did thieves have the option of returning goods and thus setting their own punishment after they are called to the carpet. I'm reminded of two events that I want to share because, you know, we, we encounter these things every day. One involved a government official who had been sentenced for embezzlement. One of the commentators in the article said that, the, that because the man was an MP and because he had many wives and many children, the court should have been lenient with him. I read through all the responses on the online news item and not one person spoke to the inappropriateness of that remark in the article. No one said that the fact was, on the contrary, having been in breach of the trust reposed in him by his fellow citizens, he needed a harsher sentence than the proverbial common criminal. The other I heard on the radio last month an assembly man had collected a large amount of money from his constituents, ostensibly to get them prepaid meters. The prepaid meters did not arrive, and the funds also did not come back. And the interviewer on the radio was speaking to somebody from the district and saying, what are we going to do about this? Well, the man kept saying, oh, I have talked to him. I have spoken with him and that he has promised to return the money and that the people from whom he took the money should, quote, exercise patience. <laughs> Nowhere in the discussion was the word crime ever used. And I found it quite interesting. These are the lessons we are teaching our children. We are teaching them that if you are powerful enough, you can take what is not yours and suffer no consequences. Whatsoever. Additionally, victims of crimes should be patient to allow criminals to change course in their own time. You know, I mean, how can a policy which revolves around state bungalows being falsely appraised and sold to elected officials be sustained? For many years, the failure of successive governments to provide adequate accommodation to people that we train on the state's dime to go to rural areas has undermined rural development in this country. Yet, when people serve in Accra, they want to take their houses with them. This is all about integrity, isn't it? This has resulted in this very slow pace of rural development. I, I don't think that uh, any circumstances 
the already inadequate infrastructure of public services should be subjected to the predatory whims of the beneficiaries of those perks. This is akin to kicking the gift horse in the teeth. The principle on which sales are based is rooted in enabling influence peddling and daylight robbery. We should have a system in which there should be no expectation of leaving government service with any items falsely depreciated below market value. Only then will we begin to attract individuals who are truly willing to serve and sacrifice for the nation. Frederick Bastier, 1801 to 1850, a French author, economist, and statesman, noted that when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men, we are exempting women on this one, living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And that's where we are currently in this country. We have created systems that allow people to steal from the state. That's where we are. I have asked the question before, earlier, what is our national ethos? What is it? What principles are we wedded to as a nation and absolutely unwilling to compromise? In essence, what is our big idea? What actions can we truly consider not in keeping with our national character and worthy of serious retribution within our society? Really, this is at the heart of the matter. If we do not ask these questions, we cannot begin to empower our society with the structures for ethical development. This form of national development is not cheap, and there will be many unhappy people, but we must begin to stand up for what is right because we are losing billions of CDs annually as successive governments fail to be emblems of ethical thought and action. This would make such a great difference if we were able to do this. Is this a job for the Council of State? Is it a job for the National Council for Civic Education? Well, maybe we have the structures, but we're not really using them. You know, a liberal education is at the heart of the birth of productive citizens. But as you will all note, very often when there are reshuffles in government, the Ministry of Education is one of the ones that gets shuffled around pretty quickly. And it never seems to have long-term leadership. And then, without the long-term leadership, our young citizens are not able to be properly prepared to serve in and enjoy a modern nation. Civic literacy at the outset of formal education is the greatest protection for our democracy. Speaking of the Constitution, I don't know if there's a children's version of the Constitution available. Uh, I don't see any young people debating any constitutional issues around us. So the Ministry of Education is not a throwaway ministry. On the contrary, any discerning and thoughtful individual knows that in this ministry lie the treasures of the future. Our very future depends on the creativity and seriousness with which we approach literacy, science, and technology at all levels. If you will permit me to quote Mr. Trudeau again, he says, the past is to be respected and acknowledged, but not worshipped. It is our future in which we will find our greatness. Mere talk is not going to shape behavior. Believe me, I'm a psychiatrist and I can tell you that. But, both, but bold initiatives that are well designed, implemented, evaluated and refined will offer some hope to the suffering masses at the ports of entry, on the roads and in government offices. We see the theft of state revenue around us every day. If you are not prepared to play the game, 
then what you require from many public service units is either delayed or denied. Every morning when I'm at home in Ampeni in the central region, I drive into Elmina. I pass a police checkpoint at Brunyibama. Here I see the police officers pulling over commercial vehicles, collecting their private tolls, and letting vehicles with obvious safety violations through. The motto of the Ghana Police Service is integrity and service. At Bronyibuma, I see no integrity dis displayed and certainly no service offered to this nation. Maybe it is just at Bronyibuma, but that is where I see it every day. Revenue is collected not on behalf of the state, and the safety of the road users is actually compromised by the police officers directly. There is an opportunity for policies that are truly transformational with a reach well into the future, long past this four-year election cycle. Our policies must imbue citizens very early in their development with ethical behaviors, which will endure in the service of a productive and vibrant nation. To this end, I think the Ministry of Information, though it is only one of 120 ministries, should be the Ministry of Citizenship. That's what we need, with a central role in shaping behaviors in the secular sector that will make us ethical competitors in the global enterprise. So there is an African proverb, I don't know where it's from, but it says, if you hold the head and neck of a snake, what is left is really a piece of rope. So you figure that one out. But the point is that integrity is the twin of cultural identity. It is based on non-negotiable principles that shape the lives of individuals, families, and communities. Integrity speaks to authenticity. As in Accra Academy's motto, Esse quam videri, to be rather than to be seen. True cultural identity comes from a cohesive sense of history. One generation's life is the history of the next generation. And the histories together become tradition. The continuity, this continuity, so necessary for the development of cultural identity is what we lost with the arrival of Europeans on our shores. The moment you enter another person's history from the position of a conquered people, the journey to reclaiming your own identity becomes increasingly complex. The moment someone else writes your history, you are effectively written out of world history, and what is presented on your behalf is only a shadow of your true self. For many years, history as a subject was not taught in junior high schools, and in senior high schools, only those who wanted to study history took it as an elective. We have thus created a generation that does not know itself, and has no self to pass on to the next. Such is the dilemma of the current generation. History has been returned to the curriculum recently, but it is woefully Eurocentric and has also been to some degree politicized and does not bode well for developing a sense of cultural pride as a basis of integrity development in our youth. What then is the role of traditional institutions, damaged and battle-weary as they are, in the quest for the restoration of integrity in public life? There is no easy answer to this question, because herein lies the cumulative and ongoing cost of the transatlantic tra slave trade, the colonial era, and our current neo-colonial reality. Traditional authorities and local government claim legitimacy and authority based on entirely different factors. Local government claims authority based on democracy 
and constitutional legality, much of which is inherited from the colonial period, despite the fact that colonialism itself was anti-democratic. Traditional leaders claim legitimacy based on history and religion. Historically, traditional leaders claim political authority derived from the pre-colonial period. They are seen to represent indigenous, truly African values and authority. Religiously, they claim links to the divine, whether a god, a spirit, or the ancestors. Traditional leaders are not always legitimate just because they are traditional leaders. As agents of both tradition and change, it is vital that chiefs' competencies meet the economic, administrative, and political needs of the day. Justice Crabb attempted to represent the role of chiefs in governance in the modern era through the, constitution, through the institution of the Council of State, in place of the bicameral parliament. One of the original key provisions was that the leader of the opposition would automatically be a member of this advisory body to the executive. But just like with the PDA, the politicians had their own ideas, and this did not see the light of day. And now the Council of State is merely an adjunct to the executive. So I'm just going to go back to a few, a few years back. So while I was somewhere in the middle of secondary school, I discovered two books in my father's study. One was Fanti Customary Law by John Mensasaba, and the other was St. George of Elmina, Its Traditions and Customs by J. Sylvanus Wattenberg. I had accidentally stumbled upon systematically suppressed information. In short, it was the first time I realized vividly that we had our own history our own traditions, our own values, because it was the first time I was reading something historical that was not passed through a British lens. And it really had an impact on me. While my Eurocentric history books begin the story of Edna or Elmina in 1482, Wartenberg's story, believe it or not, is a black guy from Elmina, um, begins in 1305. So already about 150 or more years were taken away. But I would like to spend some time on John Mensa Saba because in my opinion, he's the single most important figure to whom we owe our current version of freedom. John Mensa Saba was described as a socialist by some because of the expression of Ubuntu or the African personality and African consciousness throughout his short and most eventful life. According to Saba, and I'll quote him here, he who uses his opportunities to help raise the masses of his brethren to his own high level is following his destiny and cannot be engaged in nobler work. But when from indifference or deliberate choice an educated African becomes a tool to Europeans of the baser sort and keeps a back directly or indirectly, the masses in ignorance and superstition, he becomes the greatest enemy of his own downtrodden and long-suffering race. And the greater his educational attainment and opportunities, the graver his fault and his personal guilt. When Nananum of the Central and Western Provinces of the Gold Coast delegated the Aborigines Rights Protection Society to oppose the 1897 Lands Bill in the Legislative Council. Saba undertook this case knowing that if the chiefs were dispossessed of their sovereignty over the land, the people would lose their power, their spirituality, their material resources, and their very essence. The chiefs offered to pay him 400 guineas, but in, serving, but, but in declining the honorarium, he wrote, I do not spurn or refuse the very handsome retainer of 400 guineas. But in serving my country in the land of my birth, within her borders, I seek no reward, nor expect any remuneration. And did I ever dream of any recognition for such humble services? 
which I have performed, the fact that in such a crisis, my countrymen selected me to plead their cause is in itself a solemn honor, which will not be unremembered or unappreciated by me. I shall always treasure the confidence which, in this instance, my countrymen have reposed in me. Saba understood fundamentally the centrality of the knowledge of one's historical origins as the basis for self-respect, personal and hence national integrity. You know, today, we all talk about how the Chinese have dug up our country and dirtied our rivers. But really, this is Saba's point. If you have self-respect, and if you respect your own laws, no foreigner will come in and break laws. Because they see that you are a law-abiding society, they will fall in line. But if they come in, and you are not respecting your own laws, they will take it to a higher level. We have always been called the Gold Coast. Gold has always been here, but it has never been dug up like the way it has been dug up now. And this is Saba's key point. Azu Crab, related to VCRC Crab, wrote a biography of Saba and said, John Mensa Saba was indeed a great man. He was proud of his race and country, and he reminded the youth of his generation, and indeed of all times, of that self-respect of their ancestors, who were once described as a high-bred and aristocratic race. He believed in the absolute equality of his race with other races, and was firmly convinced that given the chance, the African can make a vital contribution to the development and happiness of mankind. John Mesa Saba was born in 1864, called to the bar in 1887, and died in 1910. Truly, integrity is hard to define. It has many characteristics which we can point to. In Akan, probably the closest term would be Asuzi, which speaks to responsibility, duty, and obligation. John Mensah Saba had just that, no more and no less. From an example of in integrity in our past, let us reflect on what we see in the current global environment. There is something to be said for the privilege of traveling and living outside one's own country, because it provides you with a newfound objectivity, which is rare when your mother country is the only cook of the meals you've always had. The implications of Saba's legal victory became really clear to me as a young man in my 20s living in Canada. I came face to face with the indigenous Canadians, now called First Nations, from whom the land had been stolen by the conquering Europeans. They were kept in reserves and divided between those who had status and those who did not have status, depending on whether they chose to live on the reserve or to live off the reserve. If you stayed on the reserve, your life was controlled by what was then called the Ministry of Indian Affairs. It is from this model that the Bantustan system of apartheid drew its inspiration. It became clear to me that if John Mensah Saba had not put his country ahead of everything else, this would have been our fate. It really, really became clear to me that placing principle ahead of all else is the foundation of integrity. The interlopers, being the modern Canadians, practice a version of Westminster democracy, which has been thriving on the basis of the equality of white men, but built on a foundation of genocide, which was barely acknowledged. However, I did learn a few lessons while I was there. You know, one day, um, A member of parliament in Canada was, I think, in a hurry, just like our people are in a hurry around here. And he tried to charge this line at the airport. And the people said, no way. We pay you to go there. Just join us in the line. And it, this you know, hit the papers, and everybody was quite exercised by it. But really, the indigenous Canadians themselves lived on a basis of principles which were guided by honesty, humility, respect, wisdom, love, truth, and courage, which, is defi which defined integrity in their own culture. I actually ended up buying a book called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, 
by D. Brown. It is the story of the loss of Native American lands through genocide, which ironically helped me to understand the perils we face in Africa. But a memory that is probably more important to share before we close for the evening is that during 1987, there was a provincial election in New Brunswick. New Brunswick had been governed continuously by the Conservative Party. But during that election, the Liberal Party won all the seats, painted the province red. So I was expecting the new, prime, the new premier to come up on stage overjoyed. He actually looked rather perplexed. And when he came, he explained his angst. He said, because there was no opposition, he was unsure of how he was going to govern the province. Because in Africa, this would have been a license for changing the constitution. But <laughs> he, he was very, very disturbed. He did not see his new status as a license for dictatorship. He made an impassioned plea to the members of the press that they would have to work very hard to function as an opposition and criticize the government wherever they saw evidence of wrongdoing. This brings me to journalism in our own setting. The New Brunswick story shows how important the fourth estate is in a democracy. Print journalists, those on the radio, TV, in the virtual world, should realize the importance of their role in a democracy. They should be guided by the principles of objectivity and fairness in reporting, but also should research the areas that they report on and offer analyses based on very hard work in the service of the national good on a daily basis. For sometimes, the press is all we have to influence a political system when it has been taken over by money and self-interest of those who have been voted in to be of service to all of us. The work of journalists is to facilitate the, distinguish, the distinction between truth, knowledge, information, and belief for the public. This is an integral part of a democracy, and it is true, it, it is through a free press that citizens are heard. With these thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, I will bring this talk to a close, hoping that I have shared with you a few thoughts that might help us in finding ways to bring integrity back to its rightful place in public life in this beloved country of ours. Men and women of great integrity, many of whom have toiled silently, have been the foundation of this country as true public servants, among whom we count Justice VCRAC Crab, whose life of service has brought us together today. Clearly, his contributions were so outstanding that they continue to spur us on to be the best versions of ourselves in the service of our nation, our continent, and the African race around the world. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Professor Uzen, I believe my fellow Crabites have said it all with a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And something that stood out, and I'm sure we'll be discussing that very shortly when we start our panel, is if we were to describe our national ethos today, what three words would we use? We'll look at that shortly, but during the, the very insightful lecture that you gave, though you didn't tell us much about yourself, you did tell us that you're a psychiatrist, you're very well traveled, definitely intelligent, and you read a lot of books. Let me give you a brief of who our keynote speaker for this evening has been. Professor Olsen was educated, of course, he did mention at St. Augustine's College in Cape Coast. Now, he graduated 
from the University of Ghana Medical School in 1978 and completed his postgraduate education in psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Now his academic appointments include at the University of Cape Coast School of Medical Sciences and Northern Ontario School of Medicine. He's the co-founder of Toronto's Afrofest, the largest African music festival in North America. He's also the chairman of the board of the Edward Olsen Memorial Foundation, which operates the Elmina Java Museum and the EAUMF Healthcare Volunteer Program responsible for supporting over 200 medical volunteers to the KEEA district for over 15 years. Now this organization has awarded scholarships to numerous youth from the KEEA district for tertiary education. He's an author, an essayist, a commentator on social and political scene in Ghana. Professor Ulzen has engaged in extensive volunteer work in medical practice and medical education in Ghana. He's married with three children, adult children, and one grandchild. Definitely worth emulating. Thank you very much, sir. And as the conversation goes, we're going to start our panel discussion. So, Prof, I believe you are the first gentleman I'm going to invite up to the stage. There'll be two other gentlemen to join him, so we can give him a round of applause as I introduce the other two gentlemen that will be joining Professor Olsen. Now, the panel discussion is going to consist Dr. Caesar Atuyire. We're also going to have Mr. Anthony Ayande Akambong Twak and Professor Thaddeus Ulzen, who of course is already with us. Gentlemen, please do join the professor as I introduce and read out their profiles for you. I think we can do better than that. Uh, Dr. Caesar, I'm already promoting you to Professor Dr. Atiri. He is a lecturer at philosophy and classics at the University of Ghana and has recently been appointed visiting fellow at All Souls College, Oxford University. He previously spent 10 years at the Vatican in service as a priest. He is a former CEO of Opera Romana. Um, Pelagiriani, that's ORP, a Roman organization for pilgrims and cultural tourism that operates from the Vatican. He also serves as a member of Ethics Committee for Basic and Applied Sciences. In addition, he is the founder and president of Amicus Onlus, an NGO which provides healthcare and vocational skills training to marginalized communities in central and western regions of Ghana. He is, uh, current areas of research include anthropological and so sociological impact of new internet-based technologies and artificial intelligence, evaluation of the University of Human Rights a talk. Now, he will be giving us a lot of perspectives about moral philosopher and truth and integrity. I believe we can give him another round of applause. Anthony Akambon Twak is a retired chief analyst from the Bureau of National Investigation, BNI, in April 2017, after 29 years of meritorious service. He held varied portfolios at the BNI, ranging from officer in charge of BNI operations at the Kutka International Airport. He's also been special, at the Special Duties Headquarters that was from 2007 to 2009, Eastern Regional Commander, and finally back to the headquarters with analysis section until his requirement. He's the executive director of Zalasa Center for Peace, Security and Governance in Accra. He'll be giving us more on the importance of integrity in the security and well-being of the state. Sir, you're once again welcome to our stage. Many more personalities that I will introduce as we go on with the evening, but let's start the conversation with the three words we would use to describe the current national ethos. Prof, I'll start with you. <laughs> well, I don't know that 
you know, I would approach it that way. Um, maybe yes, there are elements. I think that I addressed the important elements in my talk, but the the real issue is posing that question as part of growing up within a culture. That what does this culture value? What does this culture stand for? Um, is this a country worth dying for? Those kinds of questions. And if you are dying for it, for what principles are you laying down your life? I think that's where I would leave it, and I really would like to have more contributions from everyone about that. And uh, Ms. Akam Bontwak, do tell us. Thank you, madam. And thank you, all the listeners. Um, if the, you know, anybody who has a question has an answer inside that question. So if, <laughs> in the process of answering this question, he tells us that these are the values he looks at. I don't think I have too much to add. But then, we are talking about a nation that has to survive challenges. And if we see ourselves as part of the problems and challenges, then we need to look into ourselves for solutions. That's all I will say. OK. Um, I think we need to start off with a bit of conceptual clarification, because in these discourses, my opinion is that sometimes there's a lot of conceptual promiscuity. In the first place, um, we often confuse being a country with being a nation. A country is a legal reality that needs four characteristics to be qualified, just a document. A nation is a cultural reality. And there are nations that are, not, that are actually not even countries. So a nation requires much more than a legal framework. It requires a certain amount of cultural unity and cultural sharing, an experience of shared values. When Italy was formed, um, one of the fighters for the unity of Italy, the unity of Italy, it was carved out of several nations, Massimo D'Azeglio said something. He said, l'Italia è fatta, resta da fare gli italiani. Tra tra translation is, Italy has been made. It is now left to make the Italians. We can translate that into our Ghanaian situation. Ghana has been born. We are left with actually training and forming the Ghanaians. People with a strong sense of nationhood. Now, nationhood being a cultural reality is not coterminous building nation with building an economic, highly vibrant community. For example, in Spain today, we have problems with the Catalans who want to break away, and it's not for just because Spain is not a vibrant economy but it's because the national project has not been realized that brings all of them to feel identified with the crown in Madrid. Now, we live in a, a country, um, and sometimes we're very quick to call ourselves a nation state, but we should be careful about that. Um, I don't know whether we are a nation state, and I've actually published a paper um, the journal called National Identities, where I put Ghana to the test, and I would say 66% nation, 100% country. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, and it's I mean, sci with scientific criteria to see whether we are a nation. I mean, we are an artificial reality that was produced by colonialism. The fact that I'm a bolsa from Sandema, and I'm sitting here with Prof who is of Fante origin from Elmina. The fact that we are here together and we share the same nationality is a colonial creation. And we need to take stock of that. 
And once we've taken stock of that, this is our reality. And out of this reality, we have to build a people. And together, we have to march. Um, if I'm taking too much time, let me know. <laughs> right, okay, sorry. And together, we have to move forward. Now, when we take stock of that reality, we need to also be aware that actually national identities and even ethnocultural identities are built sometimes around lies. There's a great Ghanaian philosopher, Kwame Antonia Pierre, among the top 50 philosophers in the world today, who's actually published a book which will be awarded among the six top books named by the British Academy um, called The Lies That Bind Us. That's the title of his book. Now, we need a sort of story. The Greeks used to talk about mythos, which is different from logos. And mythos is what brings us together. Let me use an example, and I hope no one will be offended by this example. One of the strongest nations in this country is the Ashanti nation. The Ashanti nation is built around an event. People, Osei Tutu, Okonfo Anoche, the golden stool, the sword in the ground. Do we want to analyze that fact historically and scientifically? And is it necessary to do so? We don't need to, because maybe we'll find some loopholes in it when we start looking at it in detail scientifically. But the myth is important. That identity and the whole nation, the Ashanti nation, with a king, has been built around that myth. The ancient Roman Empire was built around the story of Remus and Romulus being raised up by a wolf. Pack of lies. Right? But it doesn't matter. This is our reality. And so when you talk about an ethos, we need to go back to our roots, our foundational roots, and see how we can actually find those lies that bind us. That will become our national mythos. Nkrumah did have an intuition about these things. And Nkrumah raising up that whole idea of the black star of Africa, where Ghana, with our red, gold, green, we were the leading star of Africa, and our independence was meaningless unless it's linked up to the whole um, liberation of the African continent, giving us a kind of national unity. And these things are built around soft values, around art, around music, around literature, around education, around values. And this is how we build a nation. We don't build a nation by just working on economy. And I'll give you an example of what I call political hamartia. Hamartia in Greek means sin. Nkrumah, to do this, created, for example, the young pioneers. Okay, there were many mistakes with the young pioneers. Many mistakes. But if you read the young pioneers charter, there were things like respect for the nation, respect for our elders and all that. I mean, there were values that were soft values that he was promoting. If I take today's nation-building corps, which has been created, I see looking for jobs for graduates. Okay, now, do graduates with jobs suddenly build a nation? But we have forgotten about that. That is why I call it hamartia, because hamartia in Greek, which is sin, which we translate in English as sin, comes from, you know, archery, when you are shooting bows and arrows. And when you shoot in the wrong, to, and you just miss target, that's what is actually a sin. And we are committing political hamartia daily. Thank you. Definitely very, very interesting view. It brings to, to question, and I'm coming to you now, um, Dr. Atiyure. When we look at the moral philosopher on truth and integrity, what exactly do we need to be looking out for? You want me to continue? Okay, <laughs> I, I hope I'm not 
taking too much. Uh, no. I, 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 I will let you. I will let you. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me. Now, integrity is another one of these words that is commonly abused. Even at the University of Ghana, we start off by calling ourselves integri procedamus. And I hear people translating is, let us proceed with integrity. Nonsense. Integri is not integritas. Let's just learn basic Latin. Integri means wholeness. It, it is linked to the word integer. And we all know integral numbers, at least we studied that in our mathematics. Now, integri means to be whole, and the integri procedamus, which was actually used by the Roman legions, referred to when you're fighting with um, shields, being compact and together moving. Now, that word migrated towards the Saxon, the Greek, I mean the French language is integrité, and then moved into English to become integrity. So, what we're looking at is a dual, in, a dual meaning of that word, integrity, and we need, to find, we need to have it clear because, you know, when we talk about nation building based on integrity, if we don't know what integrity is and we don't know what nation building is, then we're basically just navigating in open seas. So, when we come back to integrity, what we see is a dual dimension. The wholeness refers to a word that Prof used, which was a sort of authentic living, a pure living, right? I mean, uh, Horace, I was just looking at it, Horace used the Roman, wrote about integer vite sceleris um, purus, e sceleriscue purus, like a, a whole life is a life that is pure of sort of like um, errors and basically incoherences. So when we're talking about being, I mean, living with integrity is having some sort of solidity and core it to the core of your identity. But that in itself does not build a nation. Because I can be sure of myself. I can be, practice integrity and not contribute towards nation building. Because I'm just interested in being coherent with myself. But if we take the second meaning of integrity, which is being compact and together to form one whole unity, then integrity can contribute towards nation building. That is the second dimension of the meaning of the word. But this form of integrity, we have to be very careful. It is not to create a monolithic unity, because we cannot be a monolithic unity. We come from different ethnic, religious, and cultural backgrounds, so we have to create a kind of pluralistic communion that will build our nation. So even that word integrity needs to be unpacked. Uh, Mr. Akampontuak, looking at unpacking the word integrity, now we know that there are two different dimensions of it. How important is integrity? You have to tell us which integrity you're referring to at this point. <laughs> what is the importance in the security and well-being of the state? Good, thank you very much. Like, I like the, the fact that you are drawing me into security because that's where I also play my part very well. The one British uh, lexicographer and writer, Joseph Samuel, lived between 1709 and 1784, once wrote that integrity without knowledge is weak and useless. And knowledge without integrity is dangerous and dreadful. Now, when you look at this in the context, what are we talking, when we are talking about integrity for nation building? Are we talking about integrity without knowledge or knowledge without integrity? Last week I had a conversation with Adezi Kanga, a former deputy electoral commission on this uh, uh, subject. And he said they grew up with morals, discipline, and a certain value. But as far as he's concerned, this our generation have lost it. We don't have anything like integrity. What I figure is just like 
No one would like to take a flight on a plane which cannot uh, be trusted. For instance, if you don't know about the true airworthiness of a particular plane, I won't talk about Boeing in its current state, you would like to take a flight in it. So if the integrity of a particular uh, object or person that is is trustworthiness is in doubt. Certainly, it is a vehicle that you would not like to move in. You see, there is one thing that I see about uh, this issue about integrity. You walk into a restaurant and you want to eat an egg, be it an omelette or um, uh, fried, poached or whatever and you uh, make your demand. Um, most of the time, you will not even have that sense of thinking about the shell of the egg because you are focusing on the product you want to consume. But if you care to know, the shell is what has kept that egg whole. That has made it not to get rotten or that has made it not to uh, I mean lose what its value is but nobody thinks about the shell you think about the omelette or the whatever you are going to consume that is how we handle integrity in this country especially when it comes to public service I'll talk about public service most of the time. Let's for example, um, you see, I, I really wrote a text, uh, and, and the discussion is taking me off uh, uh, the text I wrote. Yeah. You know, the recruitment process, how we get people into public service, has brought a lot of questions as to exactly what our objectives are. You know, because we want people to perform functions that would advance the interest of the nation to build a state. But we, at the same time, want people who would satisfy us as individuals, as politicians, and so there is a conflict here. And normally, because it is the politician who calls the shots, the conflict skews to his interest. And in that case, the whole integrity process is compromised. There are several examples that we can cite. So um, the issue of integrity has to look at there was a time that, back to recruitment process, the Ghana Armed Forces dismissed a whole intake of uh, soldiers, uh, recruits, uh, who were supposed to be passed out at the Shy Hills. Because they had a certain feeling that the people, uh, they would not meet the professional standards of the Ghana Armed Forces at that time. The whole intake was dismissed. And created a lot of uproar in the country. But I think that was integrity in action, where you notice that, no, we have a certain standard that we want to uh, meet, and these products that we are cultivating will not help us to meet that standard. I'm not going to talk about um, uh, 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 a political activist who uh, 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 is being promoted to the rank of officer just because he decided to be political, a professional soldier. How this soldier is going to live among his fellow, uh, his mates, some of who continue to work in the ranks. And how he is going to relate with officers he once saluted 
is a matter that is to be discussed later. So you see that sometimes the political uh, uh, interferences create internal contradictions which would not allow the expected integrity that we need to build nations survive. I would like to uh, say that sometimes we employ public servants to write elaborate speeches for us. We dress very well to go and present these speeches. We ride in vehicles and whatever. I will call all those packages. Packages. What is important is the content. What is inside us that we want to give to those who voted us into power. If we have not been able to give the young and upcoming a toast of what really integrity is and have not been able to teach them how to uh, I mean work towards nation building then we have failed because one day we have to account to these very youth who are already dissolution they are about 60 percent of the population and they'll be asking, what did our fathers do? What did the generations before us do that we have found ourselves at this level? So, uh, I'm thinking that whilst we are talking about integrity, we are also thinking about the future of uh, uh, these young people who would one day be questioning our role in not making them live in a country that they can be very productive and where they can derive much pride. Thank you. And, and Prof, on, on that note, it's clear in VCRAC's narration of his childhood and also in the presentation that you gave that parenting is so important when it comes to raising children who would become adults with integrity. During his time, he speaks about punctuality, respect, even general appearance when going to work. Now we have a lot of concerns about public service, people coming in late and leaving early, a seeming lackadaisical attitude when it comes to work. Is it a problem of parenting or what is the fundamental problem here? Well, I mean, it, it, it would certainly be more complex than that. Um, in many ways, people sometimes look back at their lives and pinpoint a key element that they feel has been influential. But it doesn't mean it's the only aspect or that it's, it's, it, it really is uh, it's a narrative that we create for ourselves. Yes, I mean, parenting is important, but uh, the society itself has to have, you see, human beings don't just, human beings don't behave well because it's good for them to behave well. Human beings behave well only when they are given few options <laughs> and they, they begin to choose options that serve them. So, Really, what I see is uh, a society in which um, we have created a value system where um, rules, we are not a rule governed society anymore. I mean, in many ways. Well, it's a number of, uh, it's a number of events. I mean, I, I picked only one dimension, which, which was to look at curriculum and say, if children go to school, and they don't know anything, they don't have a historical narrative of themselves as people, then if they encounter another person, they don't have a value system that they are wedded to, that they are operating from. So then they are easily influenced by anything else that is out there. But yes, parenting is where that process begins in a culture, but it doesn't end there. I think that is a starting point. Because later on, as people grow up, if you have children, you know that the moment they walk outside from your house, they are under the influence of a lot of other things. 
and you want them to be able to use what you have taught them to evaluate those other realities that they encounter. Yeah. So, Doc, then in, in, in that case, how did we get to the Ghana of the 1960s, the immediate post-independence Ghana, to the Ghana that we see today, to the Ghana that we desire to get better, to the Ghana that we know what the solutions are, and yet we find it difficult to implement. I say we know what the solutions are because when you listen to Prof, mm -hmm. he offers a number of solutions, what we need to do, yeah. the, kind of, the kind of inspiration and motivation. We know what is required, yeah. but there seems to be, is it a lack of political will? No, I mean, you remind me of something. I mean, there's a president that we, we don't often talk about, and that is President Lehman. And when you look back uh, in our history, even though he governed for only 20-something months, he was a real picture of integrity as a president, because he was honest, he was forthright, he, he, he just was there to serve the country. So if you ask what went wrong, then you should ask, you know, in what society does such a person get removed from a position in which he is functioning quite well? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, and I always remember one thing that he used to say, you know, people would criticize him and he would say, it is easy to destroy, but it is much harder to rebuild. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I agree with uh, what Prof just said, but let us remember something. Um, education is a very complex process and it is not just parenting, it is also the society in general. And part of this whole idea of actually building our own identity is so important in any educational process. Remember, the word educare is educere. It is to as it were, pull the best out of a person. We tend to educate children with the filling station mentality, the gas station. <laughs> so we consider the educanda, the student, as an empty vessel. And we go there and they, we just have to fill their heads. And the students actually, I mean, I teach at the University of Ghana, and they come in actually, and that is the whole expectation um, you're talking about history level 400 University of Ghana College of Humanities Bachelor of Arts the premier University of Ghana a month ago I asked my level 400 students let's list the presidents of Ghana since independence it took them 15 minutes <laughs> this is this is our reality and we should not be shocked by it um, now same thing, I'm teaching metaphysics and I'm teaching critical thinking and students raise up their hands and say, Doc, why don't you just tell us what the right answer is? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but when I said, look, I'm sorry, I'm not here to give you the right answers, but I'm here to arm you with thinking capacities. Mm -hmm. They find it difficult, but this is how we educate our kids in school. When you go to school, the best student is the best behaved kid from the kindergarten. Repeat after me, A, 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 B. And so that way we are not thinking. Secondly, that is at the educational level. At the home level, there is something else which is going on, which is that we actually raise up kids to have what I call an instrumental view of the truth. The instrumental view of the truth means that when a child says something that the parents approve of, the parents, the child is rewarded. When the child says something, even if it is true, but it is not pleasant to hear, the child is reprimanded. So as the, as the child goes, grows up, the person realizes that when I say the thing that the person in authority wants to hear, I will have an advantage. That means I become a pathological liar. <laughs> and Ghana is full of liars. From the mechanic to the plumber, 
I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I, I have. I mean, I, I may never be invited to this panel again <laughs> after this. But, but uh, I have a duty, which is a duty of what the, the Greeks call parisia, frankness. We, I mean, um, and people say we should have something to die for, and we. Be, I'm willing to die for parisia to say things as they are, or to die for sincerity, which, even though the etymology is debated, sincerity in the vulgar Latin, which is the Latin that we used to use, well, they used to use in the Trastevere, the, the downtown, like the Osu of Rome, was, the etymology was sinecere, which is without wax. And you know, wax used to come from the honeycomb. So it's like not only to cover it, but to sweeten it. And sincerity is take the wax off, take the sweet off, let it out, Paris here. So we need to educate our kids to have the courage to say things that may be unpleasant, but if they are true, they have to be said. And that means, that is what then leads us even in the political arena um, I mean, we all know it. We keep blaming our politicians. If I go back to my village today and I tell them, look, vote for me. I want to go to parliament. I have no money to give you. I have no, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have no cars. I can't buy you anything, but I will go to parliament and work 18 hours a day and make sure that our nation has good rules. Do you think they will vote for me? <laughs> that is it. You know, it's interesting you speak about the monetization of our politics because today our parliamentarians are calling for legislature in order to find a way of curbing the monetization because they are worried about the quality of parliamentarians in the House. Yes. Well, they say they are. And so, <laughs> you know, it, it just brings to bear another matter that we know what the problem is. It's about being committed to the actual solutions. So if in this case, in Doc's words, there are a number of pathological liars in our system, is it something that is reversible? And if it is not reversible, then what happens to the children and the young ones who come into contact with these pathological liars? Doesn't that bring about a domino effect? You know, we are dealing with, uh, I hope we are not going to try to solve all our nation's problems on this panel, but, but um, the, the other element, we, we've talked about parenting, but parenting is leadership. That is, you know, our first models of leaders are our parents, and that's where it begins, you know, and so leadership is, is also another element of, um, uh, another vehicle for development, and we've had We've had quite a mix in our 60 or so years. We've had some very good leaders and we've had some very poor ones. We've had some very dangerous ones who have destroyed uh, a lot of aspects of our society, even though, um, you know, they're still around. But, <laughs> so, but, um, but that, is, that is the truth. You know, we can't, we can't pretend that we have arrived here uh, magically. We have arrived here by actions that people have taken and we are now living with those consequences yeah so i think leadership is another dimension i think that will be for the second crab lecture but i don't think we can handle that today <laughs> um i'm very happy that you're talking about parenting we have parents who themselves need to be parented because um, uh, they, they define themselves as adults and they are producing children. But whether they've gone through the right grooming to become parents is another factor. Now we have children who don't spend much time with their parents. So there, uh, I know of families that stay like in Kaswa. They have to leave the house by 4 a.m. And by that time, maybe the children are still asleep. So the house care 
would have to prepare them for school. They come back home at 8 o'clock. So, sometimes child parent contact is reduced to a certain minimal level. The children will go to school and meet teachers who themselves are not prepared to teach because they are thinking about their meager allowances, they are thinking about other things. And so you find children growing up in a way that they lose both the parental uh, tutelage as well as what pedagogy the teachers would give them. So they find their own way anyway. Peer, uh, peer education and whatever. And unfortunately for us, now they have uh, uh, WhatsApps and they have uh, Facebook and all social those. media. So, social media. So you see that they, 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 without any formal system in the educational setup to sort of nurture them into nation builders. They will build their own world. And this is where we think we have a problem. And I think that there's a problem over here, seriously. Uh, I will not be surprised if we continue to get dysfunctional institutions. Once upon a time, a certain Obama uh, was telling us that we need to build strong institutions and not strong men. No, I listened to him, but we were clapping everywhere, saying that the man said, but if you are strong and men of integrity, can you build a strong institution? We need strong men of integrity to build strong institutions. And these institutions are supposed to help break up these young guys who would inculcate the discipline of nation building. But this, I think, it's lacking because, like we said, uh, politicians are supposed to dictate the pace, and if they don't have the direction, they will dictate the pace, and where will we arrive? That's a question I'm going to ask. Doc, is integrity attractive? Is integrity attractive? It depends. <laughs> now, I think some amount of coherence in anybody can be an attractive trait because sometimes we can actually come across people we disagree with, but because they are coherent in their positions, you can learn to respect them without necessarily agreeing with them. However, the type of moral integrity that we are talking about is a value that um, today, perhaps because of our historical condition, we do not prize a lot. When parents are raising up their kids, when kids are growing up, we are more a concern about their economic welfare than their being decent human beings. So when a young lady goes to tell her parents, I have found a man that I want to marry, the first thing they ask them is, can he take care of you? Before they, ask, before they even ask whether he's a good person. Or when you go to university and you make the mistake of choosing my faculty, which is the faculty of philosophy, <laughs> right? Your parents say, what have I done to God to punish me like this? Right, because with philosophy you can't eat. Right, so we tend to prize the economic, um, the economic values. And I mean, maybe we're painting a very negative picture here. The situation is dramatic, but it's not hopeless. One of the great things about studying history, and Prof mentioned traveling around the world, the beautiful thing is that you actually learn about experiences that are worse than ours and they've been able to come out of it. I mean, when I was living in Rome, one of the beautiful things was just moving around and looking at the names of the streets and just remembering. I mean, you walk down Via Aurelia, 
and you get down to where, I mean, the barbarians came down and ransacked the whole city, tore it down. And Rome stood up again. Um, the same thing you read about England in the, 18th, in the 19th century, if you read Oliver Twist, and you see their type of, I mean, uh, Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, and um, David Copperfield, you see the level of corruption. I mean, they were stealing from the orphans. <laughs> Yet they've been able to come out of it. So there is hope for us. Let's not just paint only the negative picture. Um, but, I mean, sometimes those of us who are involved, at least in, like, academia or these type of analysis, I say we have a vocation that was described by St. Augustine saying, it's like our society, St. Augustine talks about a boy who has a father and the father has an illness and the illness is such that if he allows the father to sleep for too long he goes into coma and he will die so the boy has to keep waking up the father every thought number of hours and the boy says look this is an ungrateful task i don't like disturbing you but it is my duty to do so and those of us who have a voice in our society it is our duty to wake up this society but that doesn't mean that it is all negative Yeah, I, I want to add something to this. Um, we're talking about society. We are living in a society that has never experienced a very a normal growth. Especially if you look at um, um, our interaction with the outside world, from the slave trade through colonialism and other kind of things. And I've always been uh, citing the example that if we uh, look at the way grafted uh, trees behave. You know, you have the root which has been superimposed or a stem superimposed on the root and you get them bearing abnormal fruits and in the process you cannot even plant those fruits and get good seed and that kind of thing. It is a kind of society that has come up through the interactive process with the outside world. So we are like a graft that would be difficult to manage without regrafting. And so, like I, he said, maybe we have to look at the process of regrafting this society to achieve that particular group. And Prof, I'll come to you on the attractiveness of integrity. A lot of the times when young people see persons who are affluent, who are wealthy, there are questions about the person's integrity. What are the individual gains, gains of integrity? We know what the societal ones are. We know that when you are a person with integrity and it's, it's widespread, it drives society forward. But what's in it for me? Why should I be, why should I have integrity? Well, I, I mean, if you value a good night's sleep, it probably should. <laughs> it probably, it probably should, should matter. <laughs> because, because if you are true to yourself, and you are true to your ethics, then you don't feel like you owe anybody anything, and then you are at peace with yourself. I mean, for me, it's that simple. <laughs> So is it then the case that we become a society which wants, which wants to receive? We become a society which is more interested in what we are receiving from others than our personal, well, personal again, gratification. You know, again, let me maybe get back to the, the point I was making about, about, about history, for example. And um, Dr. Achiri was just talking about some of the history in Rome, etc. But for me, uh, I would say that right now here, if you, most people don't know, for example, that in 1872, the whole of Elmina was raised to the ground by the British. It was completely bombarded. That's our history. But if we are not writing our own story, then it is difficult. You see, when you write your own story, then you have your own heroes, and then you have your own values, that are important in your culture. And that is so that you have heroes of integrity, heroes of bravery, 
then you have your own story. Then the value of these attributes becomes real to people who are growing up in the culture. Good. I want to add to that. The question you're asking is whether integrity is attractive. I was teaching uh, an A-level remedial class at Aquinas in economics. And something struck me to ask the students a question. So I asked them, where would you like to work when you finish school? Three quarters of the class said they would like to work with customs. <laughs> so I asked them, why? Why, why customs? I said, oh, there's, there's money there. At that time, I'm talking about 87 thereabouts. Customs was about the least paid public service institution in Ghana. And yet, in fact, you see flamboyance, uh, they had cars, they looked well fed and dressed, and they had the best wives. No. So, 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 uh, certainly, the students are not thinking about how these people got there, but they are looking at where they, they are, and they think they must be there. So, if we are talking about teaching integrity to a student who has already uh, formed the mind in this way, what results are you going to get? I was in a Uber, and a conversation, uh, I struck a conversation with the Uber driver. He justified every crime as smartness. No, anything that I mention as criminal, I said, no, 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 that's smartness. The white man is smarter than, the white man was smarter than us. That's what I was saying, colonizers. Um, anything that happened that is, was negative was because we were not smart enough. So it would be smart to are smart and then do things irrespective of what our morality is behind it. So sometimes whether we can say integrity is attractive will depend on where we are coming from. Yeah. I was just going to add, I don't remember which country it is now, but there's a country where if you um, seem to have more than your known sources of income, uh, the government intervenes. So the society also has to set its own laws, set its own benchmarks for deciding what is right and what is wrong. We can't hide behind British jurisprudence and allow people to continue to steal and say, technically, we haven't collected enough evidence. So, you know, I mean, that stuff has served us to a point. But if we are building our own nation, we have to look at our own realities and say, if you have done a job for four years and now you have 10 houses, there's something wrong. And the state needs to know. And we have to have laws that allow us to do these things. We can't just say that, oh, that's how it has always been. So, I mean, the law is not static either. It is, it is a dynamic thing. And so the society has to shape its responses to what it sees that is wrong within it. But, you know, I don't want to be negative as well. You know, I have to share a little anecdote with you. So there's this young man who uh, was driving me around, and he had always been looking for a permanent job. He had gone to a few interviews, and he really educated me because in many places, you go and they'll tell you that, okay, well, you are qualified, but if you don't have the right card, <laughs> you're not getting a job here. Okay, this is what's happening. And many of us maybe don't deal with these kinds of things, so they happen outside our purview. But he eventually got a job in one of the ministries, which will remain nameless. And soon after he got there, the other driver started telling him that, oh, he shouldn't drive the new bus, but he should always drive the old one. And he said, why? He said, oh, the old one breaks down. And when it breaks down, you can come and tell the accountant if the thing is 200 CDs. You say it is 400, and he knows. So he will give you the money, and then you will share it with you. And he said, you know, this bothered him so much. He started working there, and I tell you that in about three weeks, even though he didn't have a job, he quit. And I really respected him for that. Yes, 
And he's, he's an ordinary, struggling Ghanaian. So if you ask me what is in it for integrity, it was his peace of mind. He simply wasn't prepared to do what everybody else was doing. And that's a classic example of what Doc is saying, yes. that all hope is not lost. All hope is not lost. Yeah. Certainly. And we are going to open the panel for questions and comments, but Doc, I'm going to let you, I know there's something burning in you want to say. Yeah. Um, since we are at a Justice Crab Memorial Lecture, this is important as well. You know, we need to, and I think Crab was aware of this when he tried to introduce the institution of the Council of State within our democratic setup. The interesting thing is this, we need to realize that um, you know, ethics goes beyond legality. We are not going to write our society only by creating laws. And actually, a terribly legalistic society tends to generate more bureaucracy and corruption. And the countries that have problems with corruption actually have more institutions, anti-corruption institutions, than the countries in which there is less corruption. <laughs> and in Ghana, we've just added another one recently, yes. right, to fight corruption. And perhaps we will add more as time goes on. So it is important to work on the culture. When the culture begins to, as it were, when society begins to reject corruption, that is when the change will take place. And what you were saying, yes, I know you are a government worker. This is more or less your income. But if I see you living beyond that standard, and instead of me applauding you as a smart person, we actually begin to look at you with suspicion and disdain, then things will start changing. Um, in some of the Nordic countries, I mean, uh, in Norway and places like that, it's actually bad. If you, are, if you are rich, you actually have to make an effort to hide it. Here, I mean, we even go to take loans to buy nice cars just to raise, um, to raise our appearance. So that is where we need to start working on these values. And this comes, and I'll finish with this, this comes with what Prof was saying about telling our story. If you look at, um, and okay, it's mentioned that I worked in, uh, in, the, in the Vatican, right? One of the ways in which the church has been efficient in moral education is through a geography, which is um, translated into other words, is through telling the stories of the lives of the saints. People who have, I mean, we've all heard about St. Francis, Mother Teresa, um, all these guys. So, who are the St. Francis's of Ghana? Who are the Mother Teresa's of Ghana? Who are the, you know, the, those examples, those stories. Once we start teaching, and part of the book that will be presented, I think the book on crab that will be presented for children today goes in that direction. We need to tell local stories of our local heroes, of people who have stood up, like this driver yes. here. If we could, instead of doing the Kumawood films, <laughs> you know, of, of this, if we could do films on the stories of these boys, mm -hmm of this boy who refuses a job because he doesn't want to engage in corruption. Yeah. We make him a hero. Yeah. And these are the things that begin to affect the air, the atmosphere, the ethical environment, because morality is actually also an environmental factor. There's a moral heritage, and we need to cure that. And that will help to make these values attractive. Please mention your name and then you can go ahead. Okay, so shall we have uh, the first three and then, yes. 
Uh, my name is Adesibo. This is the panelists. What do you say about a society that welcomes Uyomi in their village and welcomes Amwatin? There was this Amwatin who had a cocaine case and he returns to his village and is a hero. Uyomi, yeah, Uyomi goes to his town folks, the chiefs and all others, have a, a deba to welcome him. How do you describe such a society? Thank you. Okay, my name is Nicholas Atampugri. To the panelists, let me say I found it extremely fascinating and I want to know if it is, it will be on YouTube. Is it on YouTube? because in all the presentations there are key ingredients that I believe we need to build upon because I'm one of those that share the view that uh, philosophers have interpreted the world the point is to change it and we must find the anchor points to begin to change it in 2017 at the launch of the social justice movement I made an argument that uh, there is a case to be made for national integrity awards a bit of it was rooted in my very elementary undergraduate psychology on classical conditioning. Uh, that the, the, the harder you pursue to punish and you don't act on the countervailing side, you are going nowhere. The, the people who are required to catch the thieves become the thieves themselves. So I think that there are the ingredients that we need to build upon to see how we can begin to address these very serious problems that we face. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Annie Komlaga, and to Dr. Caesar, I, the part that got me was uh, Ghana has been formed already, and we are here to form the Ghanaians. Tonight we've talked about integrity, but I want to ask if integrity alone can form the Ghanaians. What two others do we need strongly so that we can form the Ghanaians? Talk, I think you can start with what two others do we need, with the exception of integrity, to form the Ghanaian? Well, we need a context, right, which is, doesn't depend only on the individuals, but what I was saying earlier on, we need to you know, build our story, write our story, who we are. So it's a question of an exploration of an identity. And that, can, that doesn't necessarily even have to be a historical identity, um, if I may say something that doesn't offend people. Even the name Ghana itself, we can contest it intellectually. I mean, so Ghana was not here. The, the ancient empire of Ghana was not here. But it doesn't matter. Okay. We need to build a story around us, a story that unites us. And that story can actually start from negativity. Because our shared experience is our colonized experience, right? Um, and it doesn't matter whether the starting point is a negative story, but we can build an eye because we have had a journey together. So one, to rewrite that story and tell that story to ourselves till we drink into that story. Then, of course, there are values that are attached to that story. And this is one of the things that is very interesting, especially within uh, talking about a juridical figure like um, Justice Crabb. One of the things, I mean, Justice Crabb belongs to the first generation of indi post I mean, independence and post-colonial figures. And they did their work. Now, the thing is, the next generation that is us, maybe, is to reinterpret that work. And to reinterpret that work is to give it actually a better grounding. I mean, for example, some of us um, are beginning to question whether the partisan politics, which we have imported wholesale, is actually not one of the obstacles to nation building. Because partisanship in Africa needs to sit along ethnic and religious lines. And if you are still a young nation that is trying to build unity, yet your whole country is divided along those axes, and they are not only horizontal but vertical, 
then it becomes difficult. So we need to engage in those types of conversation. I'm not saying we should go back to one party state or whatever, but we need to engage seriously and say what are the corrective factors that we can put into this because um, we, we are now in a position to do so. At the time of independence, we just needed to affirm our difference and our identity. But now we, we exist. So we need to start engaging in those type of conversation. But to engage in that type of conversation, we need to revisit our educational system. And this is where uh, Prof said it. This is, this is a serious reality. And I will say this once again to say something politically incorrect. You know, it's not about, it's not the sexual education that is the most serious issue about our education. <laughs> there are other issues that are gravely important. And they've been going on for years. And we haven't said a thing. And this is what we call the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So we need to go back to start, to start working on those fundamentals. Um, maybe there's no single, single, I mean, recipe. If it were that simple, perhaps others would have found it by now, I'm sure. And then, okay, the Wayome and Moateng and those other people that are celebrated, and it happens. Even among the Romans, they used to have a saying that pecunia non olet. It means money doesn't smell. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. that's, that's what the ancient... So, even they had their dark side. So, every society has its dark sides. Pecunia no all it. <laughs> right. So, oh. yeah. uh, and the mm. National Integrity Awards, may God bless us and may, they give, may we begin to celebrate our heroes. I just want to draw our attention to some of the misconceptions that rule us and make us not know how to focus on certain things. Few people, even in governments, understand the difference between party, government, and state. They just mix. It. So when my party is in power, it means that I can do this and do that and do that and then go free. They don't even understand that the party is only the driver. The vehicle is a state. And the driver will drive and at a certain point he may get tired or he will die. And another driver will take over the vehicle of the state and drive it. So the Actors in politics with this um, lack of understanding of what the state machinery really is would not be able to allow the ordinary collective citizenry participate in the processes because once it is their party that is in power, then it's exclusive. They don't include other players who maybe have good intentions and have good ideas and maybe would talk differently. That is the problem. I was supposed to teach a certain class. When I got there, I was told, hey, somebody whispered in my ears. Most of the students in the class were brought in by some politicians. So I should be careful what I say. If not, I don't know what is going to happen. Because the students were misbehaving. And knowing very well that they had big people behind them, they also didn't care. That day, I changed my lesson. I put my text aside and addressed them. And I told them that, you are lucky you are here. There are people who are more qualified than you and didn't get an opportunity to come here because they didn't have anybody to bring them here. And so if you find yourself here, I would wish that you would excel and make those who bring you here, who brought you here, proud. Because you are supposed to be examples. If you want to think that those who brought you into this class would protect you wherever they are, mind you, they may not stay there forever. And when they go, you find yourself wanting because first, 
you must not even you might not have been able to inculcate the professional qualities that you need to execute whatever training you are in for so you see our politics is one of our key problems if you ask me the threat that we have in this country i would say it is our politics the politics will not even allow the right people to do the right things Prof, nothing from you well i at the risk of repeating everything that has already been said i, I think um, the uh, dr tampure's point about integrity awards is interesting the point is that as human beings we tend to be very uh, we tend to take good things for granted let me put it that way so very often to, to your point about parenting <laughs> um, if a child is doing well oh it doesn't cause any trouble it's largely ignored within the familial context because he's like they say god bless the child who has his own right so what happens very often is that then children in order to gain the kind of attention they want realize that if they can create a bit of a ruckus the parents pay more attention to them so in the larger societal context if we are not ready to recognize aspects of our lives that we consider to be valuable then those things will just disappear to dr tampere's point yes we have to actively promote values that we believe are important in our process of nation building. Yeah. Dr. Cesar Tayure, Mr. Anthony Ayande Akambontwak, and Professor Thaddeus Ulzen, thank you so very much for giving us such an insightful panel discussion. We are most, most grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I believe you can continue seating. Oh yes, you can, you can, you can. This is the very first VCRAC Crab Memorial Lecture 2019. And of course, as mentioned earlier, in our presence we have our special guest. And it's now time for us to pick some nuggets of wisdom from him. Before we bring him up, let me tell you exactly who we're referring to here. I've mentioned him before, but when it's nice, you say it twice. 84-year-old Kwekuba has been a lawyer for more than 50 years. Following his secondary education at St. Francis Pym School, he became a member of the pioneer class at the Ghana School of Law. One of his teachers was VCRAC Crab. While at the Ghana School of Law, he obtained a Fawn Foundation scholarship to pursue a master's degree LLM in constitutional law at Northwestern University, USA, where he excelled and graduated in 1963. He then moved on to study air and space law at McGill University, Canada. After his studies, he worked with UN International Confederation Free Trade Unions based in New York from 1965 to late 1966 when he returned to Ghana to serve as secretary in charge of research to the 1969 Constitutional Commission. During the Second Republic, he became the national vice chairman of the NDC. He later played a pivotal role in the survival of the Ghana oil company Goyle as its board chairman in 2001. As a private legal practitioner with his own firm, Kwikuba & Co., he has pursued several major and reported constitutional cases. Ladies and gentlemen, he's also, he's also been a member of parliament. With a resounding round of applause, with a standing ovation, Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you our special guest of honor, 84-year-old Kweku Ba, to grace us with some words of knowledge. Oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, looking around, I only find one crap speech. 
I only have one classmate, so I will not want to commit the offense of the elders. When you get older, you watch and see. But like the older say, the old say, the coin man can be and the uh, as a guest here this evening, if Charles was here, was alive, I'm sure he will be here himself. And I'm only here to take the place of Charles. I met Charles in 1959 in his first as the first class of the law school in Ghana. And we remain friends since. You all know the history of Charles. But you said a few things which I would want to make comments, or at least add to. Prof mentioned the situation in which he asked his class to name what do I say, presidents of uh, past presidents of Ghana. And I believe his class must be a university class. It is, it is a final, final year. I don't even know. A yeah, final year. So the problem of Ghana is the higher universities. The higher education, we had very little problems. When from San Seven, we could write letters. And when you wrote to the ministry, you got a reply back to the extent that in the 1969 constitution, we had to provide, make a provision that anybody who rise to the pub any public office must receive an acknowledgement of receipt. Now, that, that, where, where do we uh, lose sight of that? Uh, then uh, Prof, the second prof mentioned, you were the guest speaker, you mentioned the country in which uh, you don't say that uh, we have no evidence. I believe you were thinking of Germany. Yes, I'm sure you were thinking of Germany. Now, I don't know where we lost track. Now, if anybody says, I want evidence, you can be sure he doesn't need the evidence. Because he already has the evidence in himself. Anybody who says, I want evidence, you can be sure that person is the evidence itself. And I have known in this country 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, as leader of the opposition in parliament and in the third republic. Hila was my friend and it was his government. It was his budget. I am known to be the person and everywhere everybody say, Kokuba, oh, this is a man who brought me to court. <laughs> parliament. But the, it is not the kinky. What everybody forgets is that the budget of that year, as a result of my intervention, was set aside. Now, since then, when was the last time any government budget has been thrown out? 
let alone, it has been criticized, let alone thrown out. And that night, when I presented the kinky in the first place, 50 years now, look at the kinky, the size of the kinky. Has it changed? Has it changed? So, where are we? Where are we going? Where did we go wrong? And you, the generations, must address the matter. We have done our part. We can't, and I'm surprised, we have done our part. When we had with little, now when I came first to stand for election in 1969, to enter politics, it cost me only, I came from the U.S. with $7,000, and that is all I needed for my elections. Now, when a person has to spend 200000 to go to parliament, then you, you don't have, you don't need the, the question. You don't need to ask the question. You have the corruption right there. That is the evidence. That is the evidence. And when a man can come and tell you, I'm, I'm giving 200 vehicles to my car. What more evidence do you need? Now you do this in Germany, you will be you you will be before the court the next day. In Germany, they are checking exports. Are, I mean, you you don't need if 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 you are found if you are found with. Any money in your account, even even in the U.S., as soon as ten thousand dollars gets into your account, your bank account, you have to you have to answer the next day to the Treasury Department. You'll be written to. So this is the old man's addition to what has been said. Thank you. And let me thank you all on behalf for honoring Charles' uh, day. He would have been here presiding himself. I know that. And if it had been me, he would have come and do it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as we get to the tail end of the program, I would like to invite Professor Ajima Bedu Akosa. He is not just a professor, he's also a medical doctor. <laughs> a renowned pathologist, a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, for the launch and outdooring of the VCRAC craft, a man of the law. Sir, you're warmly welcome. He deserves a round of applause as well. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say that I don't know whether it's the streaming on social media that has not brought the kind of people that I expected to be here for the first VCRAC Crab Memorial Lecture. The entire judiciary should have been here. The entire civil service, uh, head of civil service office should have been here. There's so many things that have gone wrong in this country. It is almost as if we don't think we need to learn again. And yet, continuous education should be the guide for everybody. You learn every day and under the various circumstances. 
that we go through. VCRC Crab was a fellow of the Ghana Academy, and he never missed any function. Even at his age, he was still learning. And yet, the people of this country, particularly those that we have entrusted into positions, have stopped learning. And yet, they're running the country. One of the things that came out clearly this evening was the fact that if you don't write your own story, somebody will write your story for you. In this country, we don't honor our heroes, and we don't honor our heroes, and so we don't know our heroes. Reading is not our forte. My illiterate mother somehow got to know that reading was so important, and every Wednesday we were brought to the public library entitled to take three books you take your three books home and your mom will tell you if you read the books it will be good for you if you don't read the books hey next Wednesday go back to the library you take your books and go and collect another set and we made sure we read the books maybe this is how come where we are I have been pleasantly surprised about this book that I have in my hand. It is described as the Early Readers Biography Series. And this is, again, the work of Kwesi Amok. This is, should I say, a pediatric form of VCRC Krabs biography. It's been written for kids, it's been well illustrated, and it virtually shows everything that VCRC Krab stood for. It is an early readers series. And this is, I suppose, the next big thing. Interestingly, I mean, I've been sitting down and saying that that was going to be my hobby, the next stage of my life, writing children's books with illustrations and animations. And just, you know, today's what? Tuesday. Yesterday, I had a team of early childhood teachers, you know, in early childhood education, discussing this very thing. We were not going to write about heroes. We were going to make reading very interesting. And not A is for apple, B is for uh, banana, and uh, You know, sometimes we, we, we think that because they are three-year-olds, they cannot understand going to space. They can. If you provoke them, their mind would rewire and acquire the knowledge that you give to the children no matter the stage in which these children are. But we would do kindergarten, A is for apple, B is for the end, C is for cat, D is for, you know, for, for, for forever in kindergarten. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the major additions to help solve the problems of this country. If we know about our heroes, I think a lot of us will emulate the whole discussion that we've had, integrity, the values, and all that. If you read about people, these are the things that hit you, and these are the things that are worthy of emulation, and that is how we would all behave. But hey, I've asked the History Society of Ghana why they have not written the definitive history of this country. Nobody has an answer. I've asked, why has nobody written the big six, each individual's major contribution to the independence of this country? 
Some people say it's an accident of history. Why can't people write that X person did A, B, C, D, this person did E, F, G, H, etc., 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 and that is why they deserve, you know? We're not doing well. We're not writing our story. And if we don't write our story, the young ones will not know, and we cannot blame them. We cannot blame them. They don't know about independence. They don't know about uh, the colonial history. They don't know about slave trade. Nobody's talking about it. The Jews will never allow anybody to forget the Holocaust. Every, you live in the UK. Every week there will be a film or a documentary about it. We don't even show anything about slave trade. Nothing. They've gotten away with it. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my task is to present to you the Early Readers Biography Series. And this is on VCRSE Crab, a man of law. It is very well illustrated. Cos went to UK, went to Inner Temple as a ship, right? Played football in school, all that. And it is something that anybody, this is class two. Class two. I've been class one, a smart one, six years, can read this, and there are questions for the child to answer. And I believe that the very moment any child gets into this and starts reading things like this, we will begin to appreciate the heroes of this country. So, ladies and gentlemen, while saying congratulations to Kwesi Amok for doing this, we are here to launch this series. And in launching it, I would ask, I wish this room was absolutely jam-packed. But for those of us here, can somebody make an offer for the first of this series on VC RAC crowd? Can I get an offer from the floor? There are not a lot of us. Whatever you say, but it's a very, it's a very bold initiative, very good attempt, and I'm sure that this is not. They're going to do a lot more on, you know, the heroes of this country, and if our kids get to read, you know, books like this, you know, I want to start by six. They should know. <laughs> Level 400, they can't even say presidents of this country. An American at age eight can tell you in chronological sequence all presidents of America. All presidents of America. Level 400. How many, how many presidents have we had in this country? That they are struggling, 50 minutes. Gee, I do. Three hundred cities is the offer from our Yes, madam. 500. We like that. 1,000 CDs. 1,000 CDs. Going, going, gone. What we will do is that for the two others who made, you would also be giving copies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 I think there are how many copies? There are 50. All of us here, we can all grab copies of this wonderful, you know, th this is the beginning of what we should be doing as a country. And small things like this would add up to a very big thing. Let our children know the heroes of this country. Let us begin to write our own story. And before I sit down, let me just say something. All of us very well educated. And yet, 
most of us have not even written our family history. We do not know our family history. And who do we expect to come and write your family history for you? If you haven't done it, I know Thaddeus Ozen has done it. He's doing, he's doing so many wonderful things. He puts some of us to shame. I have started doing mine. And please, ladies and gentlemen, do yours as well. Even if you don't publish it, it will be a manuscript that generations that will come in your family will get to know their interconnectedness. And I say this, we don't even know our family medical history. Are you hypertensive? Do you have anybody who died of cancer in your family? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. It doesn't help anybody. And yet we are educated to the highest level. We will not even Google our disease. Somebody is diabetic, we will not even Google. Ask Mr. Google, what does diabetes mean? No. We'll come and sit in front of a doctor totally ignorant. Why? We think we've got to a stage where we don't have to acquire knowledge anymore. It works in our own, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help us in any way. So ladies and gentlemen, there are 50 books and, you know, please be generous when you get to the table. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for, I think I'm going to write my book as well. I think it's important. I am inspired. Thank you very much for your wise words. Ladies and gentlemen, so before me, interestingly, I have two books. One for me, and one for my child. And one man is responsible for that. But I think it's about time. We, interview, we introduced the author, Chrissy Mwak. He is founder and executive director of Umpuntu Sem Foundation, a Pan-African development and communications NGO based in Accra. He's also the co-founder of Zalasa Center for Peace and Security Studies. He's the author of Unfinished Journey, The Life and Times of VC RAC Crab, that was in 2016. Creative One, Life and Works, of Jake Otanka, Obechefi Lamte, 2016. Quest for Excellence, Biographies of 15 Alumni of Legon, 2008. Arise Ghana Youth, 2009. Social Accountability Through Active Citizenship, The Shama Model, 2017. Empowered to Lead, 2018. Transformative Women Leaders, 2019. As well as notable academic and non-academic research reports over the past decade, he has ghostwritten about 20 books for clients in Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Liberia, and the UK. He has a wide range of career experiences in communication, education, and governance, with expertise in journalism, research, development, communication, multimedia documentation, inclusive education, literary development, active citizenship, social accountability, transformative leadership, and rapporteuring. His hobbies include sky gazing, traveling, listening to birds, dancing, goldsmithing, and writing books. Mr. Kofi Amwok, you're warmly welcome to this podium. Thank you very much. Um, this bit is words of appreciation and uh, I'm very grateful. On behalf of the Mpuntisem team, uh, which is basically a team of very young, creative people, we are not many, but the kind of work we've done, um, not just in Ghana, as I said earlier, but around different parts of the continent, it's been great. And having this first 
memorial lecture in honor of Justice VCRC Crab. It's being a deliberate attempt at nation building. It is. And everybody here uh, basically, for me, speaks to Justice Crab's words that I believe actually a new generation of selfless and dedicated individuals who raised this country up to its true destination. The realization will come, and when the realization comes, will change. We don't need many people to change. I mean, to change a country or to change a nation or to build a nation. Nations are designed. Nations are engineered. What we call the United States of America was engineered and, and built around certain methods, certain mythologies, and uh, certain value systems. So having this conversation, um, for me, I really am not perturbed about the number here, because this is the thing of the universe. Once we've done this, in any case, this started from the minds of, of, of somebody, and, and it's become a reality. So the universe has picked this up and is going to take a course of its own. So this, for me, is the belief, and that is where we are going with our work. We are a very young organization, and of course, doing some of the things, uh, we are in a hurry to, to if you look at it, it's you know, it's, 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 it's well-crafted, and the idea is to re-engineer society through uh, recrafting our narratives. And that is what we really want to do. Of course, we need support whilst doing that. Justice Crab supported us, providing a lot of uh, counsel while they lived, and, uh, and, and trusted certain nation-building tasks to me. I mean, the age difference between the two of us was 60 years. And, and, and we're that close, uh, even till the last moment. Today is Justice Crab's birthday. Day. So, I, 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 this, this is deliberate. This is deliberate. This is very, very, very deli deliberate. I mean, if Justice Crab, this is, this is his birthday, and, and, and it is very deliberate. That's why it was not done around the time he died. It was actually done at the time he was born. It's a sense of regeneration. And I'm very, very happy at the immense discussion here. This, 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 the kind of conversations we've had here, you don't have them in, in certain spaces. Yes. The frankness, the quality. So, we are grateful. I'm grateful, but as we move along, of course, we'll need support from you. So we are always open for any kind of support to do some of these projects that we do. Um, you don't need to get fun funding from the typical NGOs to do some of these things. And, and it's deliberate. So you must uh, get back into your own systems and try and fall back on, on, on extra hard work to make sure that certain things you want to do, you can do them. So I'm grateful especially for the offer for for the book, I'm really, really grateful, uh, which means that uh, we'll go and we'll print more eventually, and then also, we have actually, I mean, the, they've done a series on Ephraim, Amo, Nkroma, uh, Amato, I'm sure most of my number, my generation, even 60 year olds, when you ask them whether they know about, I, I mean, Dr. Amato, most people do not have any idea who Dr. Amato was. Um, Wilhelm Amu, you know, and a number of, uh, and then of course, Professor Williams, I've just been told that uh, he's coming. Uh, he's coming into this country next month, which will be an opportunity for us to really have a conversation with him. You know, and for those of who know Prof. Williams, he was the youngest um, uh, vice ch chancellor at the University of Ghana, even though that record attempts were made to throw away. You know, and, and if you've read in Cromer's Conscientism, if you read in Cromer's Conscientism, Abrams, yes. Yes, William Abrams. William Abrams, William Abrams, yes. William Abrams, yes. 
Lemmy Brahms, if you've read Conscientism, I mean, it's been proving that he wrote about 70% of that work. And that has been proven, yes. So, and he was a All Souls uh, Fellow, just as Dr. Cesar Aturi. After him is the next Ghanaian to actually have that honor of being uh, appointed the All Souls Fellow. So we've really, there's some regeneration going on. And we, as I said, we need support in this nation building. Um, there is really like-mindedness of everybody here. And that's what Justice Crab used to do. The behind the scenes, you know, he would bring people around. Okay, how, what can we do about this? What can we do about this? And he listened to everything. He listened to everything. And then gave the solutions. So, um, not to say much, but I think what you also need to know is I have a background in education. Um, yes, so that was, I have a background in philosophy. Um, uh, let me just be of you. I was in the seminary. I was, in the, I was actually uh, trained by the Jesuits. So I was going to be a Catholic priest as well. And um, before I left, came to the University of Ghana and studied philosophy further. And I've gone further to study education. So I've done postgraduate studies in education. But uh, what I'm doing is also a very special area. It's called creative pedagogy. And it's, it's in line with that that I'm doing some of these things that I'm doing. That we need to really rethink our educational systems. But we have to build content. We have to really make sure that we train our younger ones to fit into the 21st century, but then also to be truly human. Algorithms are changing. When we are talking about the young ones not being able to talk about heads of state, it's the algorithms. Their, their brains are being occupied by all kinds of things. If we don't take care and document our stories, in the next 50 years, we will have nothing to say. Because the algorithms will determine the stories that you tell about yourself. And you don't own the algorithms, really. Even the tech ecosystem in Africa generally is not even owned by Africans. So the real alternative for us is to really get out of this oral tradition and use the skills that we've obtained and document our stories. This is the agenda that we are on. If you heard me, I've done um, ghost writing. I mean, this is what I do. It started as a hobby and I've done it for the past 10 years. You know, um, so this is, this, is, this is a culmination of a lot of things happening on, on behind the scene. I don't like publicity. So that's why you don't find a lot of things about Kwesi Amwak and all of that. Because there's a lot of work to be done in the next decades to come. And it's not about Kwesi Amwak, it's about the nation. It's about how we galvanize all our efforts to make sure that we build a nation. So I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. There are families of Justice Crab here. In fact, I would want to have a special call. If you are here and you are called Crab, please uh, rise for us to honor you for being here. Or if you are, you are directly related to Justice Crab, please, um, please show yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So that is uh, Professor Margaret Crab and her daughter also a crab. Um, and you realize that basically everybody here is a crabite. Uh, this book was dedicated to crabites. You know, when you say crabite, thank you, please sit down. Thank you so much. When you say crabites, you're looking at those that are family and those that he taught and the disciples and all of that. So those are the crabites. So we really are all crabites, as uh, Atia Wing said. I want to really humbly say a special, uh, I would want Mrs. Sofori Boateng to really rise. I know she's, she's, she's a fan. She wants to be behind the scene. But please, let's give her a hand for Mrs. Sofori Boateng. This woman was one of the close people to Justice Crab. Worked with Justice Crab at the Attorney General's Department as also a foremost legislative draft, drafter. In fact, she was one of the key people responsible for bringing Justice Crab from Barbados in the late 90s. When Barbados was almost making Justice Crab a citizen, he said he would come. So he came back. So, but behind the scene, I mean, uh, he, she doesn't want, but I feel that it's really important to acknowledge 
your presence, Mrs. Oforibuat, and for the work you did in the life of Justice Crab. You, you work like him, you work like Webbs. Behind the scene, you do all the magic, you know. You draft all the laws for the country, the parliamentarians come and make all the noise, but you, you are really the, the ones who write the laws for them. I would like to say a special thank you to um, Professor Tajima Bedu Akosa for agreeing on a very short notice to actually launch this, this book. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. And I'd like to say a special thank you to Angathad, Prof. Uh, Tadeus Olsen, Patrick Olsen. <laughs> Patrick Kwamina Olsen. <laughs> um, who is being phenomenal. I, I met Prof, was it late last year, early this year? And it's been a, yes, last year, it's been a wonderful relationship and um, for agreeing to come all the way from Alabama to come and give us this insightful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so much. I, Prof, Prof comes, comes in every year several times. He was not supposed to be here per his plans. But once we spoke to him, he says, Quasi, why not? I will come. Just try and make sure that you get me an economy ticket and I will come. And this, this for me is, is critical. And all, I will say that this has been a labor of love in honor of the memory of Justice VCIC Crab and for what he stood for for us to build a nation. I'd like to say a very big thank you to my big brother, um, Cesar Thierry, uh, who is still referred to most as Padre or <laughs> Father Thierry. A fascinating, fascinating big brother, fascinating. And also for our green, he's, he just returned from, he's been in and out of trips, you know, even though he's a professor at uh, Legon, um, he just moves in and out around the world. But as a last Wednesday, he was getting out of the airport, I mean, traveling out of the country and called me and said, Quizzy, are we on? I said, yes, sure, I'll be here. And he was here and was here on time. Thank you very much, Dr. Caesar. Uh, Alim Sinya, Atiri. And to um, another big friend and uh, co-founder of Zalasa, uh, Anthony, he also has a kwabna. He likes to hide it. He grew up in Takrade, <laughs> um, or born in Takrade, Kwabina, eh, Kwabina Ayande Akambon Tuok. He is one of the very few intelligence officers in this country that I think we should all try and know. I think we should all try and know. And serving this country for 29 years behind the scene. And, and, and if you go into the intelligence services, anybody who, if you have friends in there and you talk to them, they will tell you the type of man he has been and, and, and what he stood for. And, and, and that's why he's here. So thank you very much. Uh, come on, talk. Uh, popularly known as Carbon. So, so <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for for being here. Most of the time you don't find intelligence officers retiring and, and you seeing them, you know. So this is quite a novelty, you know, uh, apart from um, uh, Mr. Quatson, Quatson who, tends, who, Quatson who tends to write. And what most of you really, most of us, and, and, and Justice Crab really was first trained as an intelligence officer. He worked as a clerk at the police division. And when the 1948 riots happened, he was sent out as an intelligence officer to gather intelligence. So he was among the crowd, but he was gathering intelligence. And that must have shaped, that must have shaped a lot of how he ended up becoming a civil servant and how he really served every government. So that was really a training he had. You know, that impartial approach to things and, and working hard. And uh, finally, 
Finally, I would like to say a big thank you to a man who has become a close friend, a mentor, a father, my godfather, um, Kukuba, uh, who is actually the Chufuhine of Ashrase. The Tufuhine of Ashrase. Um, so, and for agreeing, he's, being, he's not been out for these several months, but once it was about just a scrub, and Kwesi had said that he decided that he will be part of it. So I would like to say a very big thank you. And I would like to say that um, his biography will be out next year, God willing. Yes. I mean, I have spent so far almost six years on Lawyer Kukuban's biography. Yeah. And, and and so the, 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 the challenge, of course, has been how do you package the information you have? He handed all his documents to me, really. Yeah. So I, I, that's the task to do. And the book is really where we are towards the end. So hopefully, God will, in next year, we'll do a launch of, uh, again, a life of someone who has lived and served this country. Finally, 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 I thank you all. I thank again my team, uh, those live streaming, Chris and the team up there, uh, Samuela and uh, Jennifer out there, Malik. Again, as I said, Mpuntisam is young and we are young, but we are um, very, very optimistic about the changes we are making. Thank you so much for coming. And what do we do? We have to sing that song again. Um, we, won't, we shouldn't sing it again, eh? Okay. All right. So it's too late. Um, we would like to go have... There's some finger foods outside there. Please let's all go. Yes. Have a chat. Yes. And, you know, and, then, and then all of that. So my duty done. I'd like to say once again, finally, thank you to all. And thank you. At hearing. Yes. So... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been an honor to be your host, to be among such brilliant ladies and gentlemen this evening. We started with a word of prayer, and so shall we end. May we bow our heads. Our Lord and our Master Jesus, we thank you so much for a successful program. We thank you for bringing us here safely. We pray that you take us back to our respective homes as safe. We pray that the conversation we have had today does not end here, that it goes beyond the walls of the venue, that we're able to impart and impact lives to ensure a better tomorrow. We thank you for the fellowship. Once again, we thank you for the life of VCRAC Crab. May this be a first of many more conversations towards the betterment of the nation. We thank you and we praise you for all this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Next year, I hope to see all your faces and many more. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening, ladies and gentlemen.